ask you to turn back again to Second Chronicles chapter 5. And once you've turned to that, then we're going to bow before the Lord in prayer. And we're going to seek the face of God. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 11. And then let's come to pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank thee once again for the privilege of using our hands to open the Word of God, using our eyes to read the Word of God, and using our ears to hear it. We pray, O Lord, that thou wilt work in our hearts this morning, that we will receive it, that, Lord, it will not, as it were, go in one ear and out the other, but, O Lord, will hearken to what thou would have to say to us. We pray, O Lord, that thou wilt come in all thy fullness and speak to the hearts of thy children today. And also, Lord, to those who are not saved, but we do pray you'll minister to us. And, Lord, that we will know what it is to be taught of God and taken on with thee. We pray, Lord, that you'll lead us this morning in paths of righteousness. We pray, O Lord, for those who are in great need today. We pray that something said in this message will help their soul. We pray, O Lord, for those who are seeking for a word from God. O Lord, speak with a voice that wakes the dead. Let them hear this morning. Lord, I pray you'll empty me of self and sin. Lord, I need thy help. I need thy unction. We pray, Lord, that thou wilt fill me with thy spirit and therefore help me to glorify thy precious name and hide me behind the cross that the world would see Christ and him alone. Lord, help us to hear today. Help us to obey. Help us to rejoice in the God of our salvation. For we ask it in our Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Amen. We're back in the book of 2 Chronicles. Um, I didn't get finished last Lord's Day morning what I wanted to say, so I wanted to come back to it. But just to remind you and to refresh your memory, uh, this book, uh, the Chronicles as a whole, first and second, Chronicles would have been written as a whole when it was written originally. And then when it was written, it was written for those who were returning from exile. They were slaves for many years. They were under different rules. They were under different religions. But now they were coming back to Zion. They were coming back to Jerusalem. They were coming back to rebuild the temple. And that temple was going to be a very important part of their worship, a very important part of the Jewish person's life. And we learned last week that the temple was descriptive of the body of Christ. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again, speaking of himself It's descriptive of the believer's body. You are the temple of God. And if you're saved, then the Spirit of God dwelleth within you. And we reminded you of what a solemn responsibility that is to treat your temple well and to treat your body with honor because in there dwells the Lord. And then the church of Jesus Christ is also a temple. We are living stones making up the temple of the Lord. And because the temple was the place where God dwells, we can consider this place to be a temple because God meets with his people when they dwell together and when they come to worship together. And I said I wanted to speak about some things in the temple which perhaps aren't spoken on very often. And last week we spoke about the steps or the way man ascended up to the temple. And as The queen of Sheba stood before the steps and looked up into the temple. She was awestruck. She was not able to express fully what she saw or what she felt. Such was the beauty of the steps up to the house of the Lord. And we were reminded in scripture last week about the steps that we take to and from the house of God. The steps that we take toward the Lord are very important steps. There are to be steps of God, steps ordered by God, steps ordered by his word, steps of faith and steps of truth. And I trust this week that the steps you've taken have taken you closer to the Lord and have taken you to a place where you're in closer fellowship with him than you were last week. And that's the first thing I wanted to leave before you about this temple that was the center of Jewish worship at this time. It was the steps or the ascending up to the temple. You know, it's a very important thing when you come to the house of God that you come prepared. That as you walk up those steps, you've come with your heart prepared. Come seeking God. Come, as it were, to hear the voice of God speaking personally to you. Not to see if the preacher's good. Not to hear if the singing's good. But friend, you prepared your heart that the Lord might speak to your soul through every aspect of this service. Don't waste these opportunities. There are people today who would love to be in the house of God. And illness prohibits them. Don't waste the privilege you have coming to the house of God. 
by coming in a slack manner or by coming unprepared, but come prepared to seek the face of God. The second thing I want to mention about the temple today is the singers in the temple. And this is a very important part because as I was studying through it, you'll find that singing is mentioned many, many, many times in Scripture. And if it's mentioned so many times in Scripture, then it's important that we have a grasp of what it means, where it speaks about the singers in the temple, about their job, what they were doing. And the Bible has much to say about that. It says there in verse number 12, also the Levites, which were the singers. So in the temple... Not only was there the Ark of the Covenant, not only was there the presence of the Lord, not only were the scrolls there, not only was the preaching there, but God ordained that singing should be found in the house of God. There should be singers there. Now, the word singing in Scripture has the idea of causing someone to behold something through words and through music. In other words, as the people sang, they were saying, behold, look at the Lord. And that was the subject of their song. And you know, that's true even today. Whatever the subject of a song is, then that is what you cause people to look to whenever you sing it. Often today, the songs of the world are about sin. And if you listen to many of the songs of the world, it will cause you to look at sin. If you listen to many of the lyrics of the songs of the world, it will cause you to think about immorality or impure thoughts that the Christian ought not to be thinking about according to uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8. But it ought to be true of the singing in the house of God that it always points us to the Savior. It always points us to the Word of God. It always points us to the person and the work of Christ. And that the hymns that we sing as a congregation, the the songs that the choir would sing, or any individual or group that would sing here, that those songs would leave the person hearing in no doubt that there is a Savior, that men and women need to be saved, that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that can save from sin. And we must be careful about the content of our singing because in the house of God, it must point people to the Lord. And that's exactly what these people were employed to do by the Lord, to sing his praise, to sing about him, to sing about the truths of Scripture as he is revealed. And you know, as you're singing these hymns, and you're singing about the person and the work of God, you shouldn't be singing aimlessly, but you should be singing with understanding. And as you understand what you're singing, then that ought to do something within your heart. It ought to bring joy within your soul. We sang this morning, there's a saviour from all sin. If you only let him into your heart, he there will reign while you trust him. He'll put the evil out, save from every fear and doubt, and you'll soon begin to shout, hallelujah. As you read those words, what powerful truths are in them. It's about the all-conquering saviour. It's about victory over sin and temptation and about the response of the child of God whenever they see the victory of Christ in their life. Hallelujah. Let's sing to the Savior. But there's something else about these singers, not just what they did, but what they wore. And this is very important because the Word of God tells us in verse number 12 that the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jeduthun, with their sons and brethren, being arrayed in white linen being arrayed in white linen. Over in First Chronicles 15, it talks about David and the singers and other workers in the temple being arrayed in uh, fine linen. Now, this is very important because let's not forget that in the temple, everything was symbolic or everything was pictorial or a type of something to come. So what is this speaking to us of? Well, the fine linen or the white linen is speaking to us of the righteousness of the saints. In other words, the only people who could truly sing the praises of the Lord were those who were saved, those who were washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are justified. And really, only those who are saved can give worship to God because their hearts are right before God. You can sing songs, but it's a different thing to sing on to the Lord and it's a different thing to worship the Lord than simply to sing or to say words. And in fact, whenever, of course, we go to the book of Revelation, I'll just read it for you in Revelation 
Chapter 7, there's a great company of people, and they're crying salvation unto our God, uh, which sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb. And it says in verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the Lamb, or the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. And verse 13, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And verse 14, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The people of God were those who sang in the temple of the Levites, those who knew God, those who are ministering through song. The people in heaven will be those who are washed in the blood, the people who know God, that was singing the song of the redeemed, the song about the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And therefore, those singing in the church of Jesus Christ and those giving praise and worship ought to be those who are saved by the grace of God. In Psalm 33, verse 1, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous. So not only do we have the thought of being justified, but we also have the thought of that continually striving for holiness and continually striving to live before the Lord in the manner which the Scripture declares us to live. And that, of course, is our sanctification. And it would be wrong for a man or a woman to come into the house of God and to stand and minister before a congregation if they were living in sin and then sing about the things of God. You see, it's not a small thing to sing, but it is something that God has ordained. See, some people regard singing as a minor thing, as the worship part of the service, as it were, the singing part of the service. Oh, well, it's just something we do before we get to the word. And of course, the word is what we look for, for Christ to speak to us. But friend, God is ordained singing. We have just read in God's word that it is comely for the upright to sing unto the Lord. In other words, it's good for them and it brings glory to God. And what an awful thing for a man or woman to come half-hearted and to open their lips and just sing the words without thinking or putting effort or putting joy within their song. It says in uh, first or Second Chronicles chapter 29 and verse number 26, uh, Second Chronicles 29 verse 26, And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpet. Verse 27, And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel, and all the congregation worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And that's important to do with the burnt offering, which we're coming to in a minute. But I want you to notice that the songs which were sung were sung, and we know this from these two passages were read from the Psalms with harps, with psalteries, with cymbals, and with trumpets. And Bible commentators would agree that those instruments are a type of joy, uh, singing with joy in our heart, singing with grace in our heart. To play those instruments was to express joy or happiness or enthusiasm or excitement. That's what those instruments were for. So it was enthusiasm and spiritual joy that accompanied the singing of God's people. And that's why we like to sing with all our heart. That's why we like good singing, why we like lively singing. We don't like to be dead in our singing because singing should be accompanied by spiritual joy because we're singing about the Lord. We're singing Singing from a heart that is being transformed. Singing is to be enjoyed, not endured. Singing is to lift you and those around you and cause you to look to the Savior. And we find here that it is honoring to the Lord to have wholehearted praise. And I believe this honoring to the Lord to have half hearted praise. But if we turn back to verse number 13 of Second Chronicles chapter 5, we want to notice the description of their singing. And it says in verse 13, of chapter 5, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and, si and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. So here's their singing. It's identified by two words, praising and thanking the Lord. Now that word praising means to be clear, to shine, to show forth and to celebrate. So as they praised, it was very clear who they were praising. It was very clear what they were singing about. They were shining forth for the Lord as they sang. 
And that word, thanking the Lord, the word thanking has a thought of worship. And the imagery behind the word in the Hebrew has a thought of someone standing before the Lord with their hands held out, saying, Lord, I have nothing but thee. I have nothing but thee. Thank you, Lord, for all you've given to me, for every good and perfect gift cometh from thee. And that's what the thought there is. We're praising very clearly the Lord for what he's done, and we are thanking and worshiping him that everything we have is from him. Notice what this, they were praising and thanking God about. It says, And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good and his mercy endureth forever, then was the house filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. And it says, So that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. Now, what were they singing about God's goodness and about God's mercy? In other words, the attributes of God. Sam tells us to sing about the power of God. Great is the power of God. And see, whenever you think about the power of God, whenever you think about how great God is, it encourages you to ask God for great things. Psalmist also tells us, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. And whenever you think about the mercies of the Lord, then you will have a heart full of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. It says that we're to sing about the righteousness of God. And whenever you sing about the righteousness and think about the righteousness and dwell in the righteousness of Christ, then you will have a great confidence because you'll be confident in his work and his righteousness, his power and his mercy. Not only that, but I want you to notice in this verse, there was a unity in the singing because it says in verse 13, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. Now, of course, whenever we're singing in a group or a choir, we're striving for unity and we're hoping everybody's together at the one place at the one time. But that's not actually what's speaking about here. It's speaking about unity of heart. And unity of purpose. In other words, the people were united. They were singing to the Lord. They were right before God. They came together under the righteousness of Christ. They came together praising the Lord. And they did it according to his word. Now let me ask you a question. What is the result of God's people dwelling together in unity? What is the result of God's people lifting up their voices, blood-bought, right before God, spirit-filled? What is the result? Well, the Word of God tells us that the Lord will come and command the blessing. What was the blessing this day? It was that the house was filled with a cloud, even the cloud of the Lord. The house was filled with a cloud. The blessing of God came down. The presence of of God was there. You know why? Because God's people were right in their heart. You may be able to sing in unity with your voice, with the person beside you. But friend, can you sing in unity with your heart, with the person beside you? And what happens here is the Bible tells us the house was filled. And I think this is one of the most beautiful thoughts because the word filled means furnished. In other words, the temple was not complete until the Lord was there. And when the Lord was there, the place was fully furnished. They had everything they needed because the presence of God was there. And folks, you can have everything in a church building. You can have the best of equipment and you can have the greatest number of people thronged to overflowing. And you can have all the money given that man or woman can give. But the house is unfurnished if the presence of God is not in the midst of his people. And that's why we need to pray that the Lord will come and furnish every work in our congregation, that the glory of the Lord will fill it, because only that, that only will result in the power of God being manifest among his people. You see, the Lord was there. Can I say to you, lives aren't complete until the Lord's there. And homes aren't complete until the Lord's there. Churches aren't complete until the Lord's there. And if there's one thing you pray for every day, you pray as child of God for the presence of the Lord. 
And it says there, the glory of the Lord. What's the glory of the Lord? That's the splendor and honor. In other words, whenever people were in that place and the glory of the Lord was there, the people stood in awe of God and the people honored the Lord. They didn't say, whoa, those singers were wonderful, as I'm sure they were. But they said, hallelujah, what a saviour. What a wonderful, wonderful Lord. Now, not only do we find these things in this passage of God's word, but we find that in scripture, songs and singing came before and after battles and victories. If you turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter 20, we find a very interesting passage. Second Chronicles in the chapter number 20. And let's read from verse number 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten, for the children of Ammon and Moab stood up and against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. And when Judah came down toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked onto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering much of the spoil, and gathering the spoil, uh, it was so much. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Baraka, and for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the place was called the Valley of Baraka unto this day. Then they returned every man to Judah and Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord was on all the kingdoms of those countries, for they had heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. And here you see that there was enemies to be defeated. These were great enemies. They were mighty enemies, enemies that did bring fear to the people of Israel, but they decided to put their trust in the Lord. You see, rather than it was sharpen their sword, they sharpened their voice. And they lifted their voice to God, and they cried to God, and they showed their confidence in God, and the singing came first, and then the battle. And you see, when the victory was won, they didn't forget about it, but they came back singing the praises of the Lord. And you'll find that in each time of revival, yes, it's been accompanied by prayer, and it's been accompanied by mighty Holy Ghost-filled preaching. It's also been accompanied by singing. There in the battle. Don't you let the devil take the song of the Lord out of your lips. Don't you let the world or sin or discouragement take the song of joy out of your heart. But you sing with confidence in the Lord. Even you should face the darkness of night or the most difficult trial or the most difficult circumstance. You still sing Praise the Lord, because his mercy still endure forever. And then turn over to First Chronicles chapter 29, where we were just, or sorry, Second Chronicles chapter 29, where we were just a few moments ago. And in Second Chronicles chapter 29, we read there just a few moments ago, uh, in the middle, well, verse 27, Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering onto the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets, and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel, and all the congregation worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And here we find the singers of the temple singing their song in the place of the burnt offering. Now that's very significant. Because as they would have sang, they would have seen the lamb slain. 
And they would have seen the blood taken out and applied to the corners of the altar. They would have seen the lamb taken and burnt upon the altar, seen the Roma go up into heaven. They'd seen all of those things. And what were they looking at as they were singing? They were looking at a picture of what Christ did in the cross of Calvary. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. See, every time in the temple a lamb was slain, that was a picture of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That was a picture. So as they sang, what had they in their minds? The work of Christ. Now, if that's the reality, when they were looking forward, and we have the privilege of looking back, and I believe as we sing, we ought to keep the work of Christ in our minds in the forefront. The blood that was shed, the cross that was occupied, the tomb that's now empty and the throne that is filled. We ought to keep the things of God upon our mind. This is not just something that we do, friend. This is worship to draw us closer to God. And therefore, not only should our songs lead us to the Savior, but our thoughts should lead us to the Savior. And by the eye of faith, as we sing, we ought to see the Son of God in all his beauty and all his majesty. Then there's something else, and I have to confess, for some time it did confuse me as I read it. But it says in the Bible... It speaks of the people singing a new song. The psalmist speaks of singing a new song. Those in heaven speak of singing a new song. And as I studied this this week, it became very clear that there are many, many new songs. But the reality is the new songs all have the same theme. The person and the work of Christ. And what the Bible speaks about when it says a new song doesn't mean a song with a different subject, but I believe it means a song from a different perspective. You see, whenever you're saved, you sing a new song. For the first time in your life, you sing on to the Lord as your Savior. But then you see there's trials you come to, and you're in a dark valley, and you wonder if you'll ever get out of this valley. But when you get out of the valley and up the mountain, then you sing a song. But that's a new song because that's from a different experience. Oh, yes, you're still singing about the power of God. You're still singing about the keeping power of the precious blood, but it's from a different perspective. Then perhaps there's been the season of loneliness or bereavement, and it's been hard, and maybe the song has seldom been sung, but the Lord's brought you through that time. And now you sing on to the Lord, and it's a new song because it's from a new experience, but it's still about the Savior. It's still about the precious blood. It's still about the cross and the power of God. And see, when we get to heaven, we'll sing a new song. But we'll still be singing about the blood. We'll still be singing about the cross. We'll still be singing about our Savior and everything that he's done for us. The only difference being, we'll be singing from a new perspective. We'll be singing from eternity. We'll be able to look back with unclouded vision. We'll be able to sing with untainted tongue. We'll be able to praise without any temptation. And yes, we'll still be singing about the blood, because that's the theme in glory. See, Psalm 40, whenever he said, he had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, he was singing about the past experience. And Revelation speaks about eternal rest, and you're singing from that experience. Praise God, there's a new song to sing every day, because there's new mercies every day. And there's new... Blessings every day, new occasions, new deliverances, new discoveries of the word of God to the soul. I thank God when we come and thank God for these things and we are blessed. But there's another beautiful thought in the word of God and I want you to turn to it. And if this doesn't convince you that singing brings honor to God, then I pray the Lord will open your eyes. Turn with me to Zephaniah. Zephaniah and chapter number three. Zephaniah chapter number 3 and verse number 17. And it says there in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse number 17, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. 
He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Now, folks, I think that's a very telling part of God's word. The Lord himself rejoices over those whom he has saved with singing. My friend, there are many things that we cannot do that God can do. We cannot create something out of nothing. We cannot be in various places at one time. We are not infinite. We are not immutable. But here's something that the Lord does that his people also can do. We can sing. We can bring praise and glory and honor to the Lord. And look what it says there. The Lord will joy over thee with singing. So not only are we to sing about the work of God, we're to sing about the victories of God, the souls that he's won. And how wonderful it is to sing songs of testimony. And to sing songs of praise of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. The Lord is rejoicing over thee with singing. Men and women, as we bring our service to a close this morning, we're finishing a few minutes early because of the funeral service this afternoon. But as we bring our service to a close this morning, let me challenge you. As the Lord looks at your life this morning, as the Lord looks at your life, is he rejoicing over you? Are you saved? Is the blood mark upon your life? Has there been repentance and conversion? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Or as yet does the Lord look upon you this morning in his house, even singing his praise? And say, I never knew him. I never knew her. One day, the voice that rejoices over those who may save will welcome us into glory. Our friend, for those who are not saved, that same voice will condemn you to hell. And I would urge you this morning, if you are not saved, come to the one of whom we sing in this congregation. Heed the gospel that we sing in this congregation. Come to Jesus for the cleansing power and be washed in the blood of the Lamb.